All right. Well, uh, let's get this started. It's we're I, I cannot tell you how many people are so excited about today's conversation. Just so good to see alumni faces. And we'll get to that in a second. We'll introduce everybody. But welcome to uh, Wild Exchange, Wild X for short. It is weekly insight, listening, and dialogue across campus. Uh, we're really uh, pleased to be able to offer this every Friday. Same Zoom link. We also have a playlist of all the previous conversations. Tom Ford's been on here before. Uh, you guys can go back and listen to any of those. I'll put the link in our chat for us. Um, basically, this is how it works. Uh, we, you're welcome to ask questions. Doug's got a few questions uh, for our panelists. He'll introduce them and have some questions for them. You guys can raise your hand and ask questions, or you can put it in the chat if you feel like doing that. We'll have a conversation for an hour or so. Um, well, we'll have a conversation for an hour. And then uh, if anyone wants to stay longer, you're welcome to, because sometimes these end up going a little longer than that. We also want to just give a shout out to our uh, Office of Access Inclusion. Oh, sorry. No, Access Inclusion and Diversity. Access Equity and Diversity. That's it. Sorry. Uh, Kalia. Even access Diversity. Okay. I know it's, it's hard. <laughs> okay. It's changed a couple times too. Uh, basically, Kalia and uh, Esperance, who have coordinated a lot of events for Black Brilliance this month and just have done a fantastic job. And we're really happy to partner with them on this month. Um, especially with our Weldex uh, presentations. So with that, welcome everybody. And I'll hand it over to Doug. Uh, yes, welcome. It was actually Kalia's idea to have this platform. And so she, she wanted the idea of people from different generations to be part of a platform where we can have a conversation. And I go, I go well, I know guys. I've coached with guys and I played with guys and I, uh, I got to work with and um, guys over the years and I'm kind of one of the oldest guys here on in our department. So I know a lot of people and uh, I, I'm so grateful to have uh, uh, these guys join us. I'm, I'm also I have bad news. Uh, my teammate, Tony Toplin, uh, just texted me. He, he could, he can't make it. He's in the Bay area and uh, he's working where he has no access to his phone. So he's going to call me tonight and fill me in. I was just hoping that he would be on because he always called me, Hey, big Doug, you know, when we were on campus. So, and we were also fraternity brothers, so we spent a lot of time together. So T Tony won't make it, and hopefully Drake Drake's gonna make it here soon. But I'll introduce. He's here. Oh, there he is. How's it, Drake? Drake's here. Good, he made it. So I'll go ahead and introduce to every introduce everyone, and um, you know, grateful for me. I've, I've 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 coached and worked with Thomas, and I've coached with Tremaine, and I to, to let Tremaine know that. I went through a depression when both Tremaine and uh, Daryl Agposa left coaching football because I didn't have my guys to hang out with anymore. But it's lucky that Tremaine stayed here in McMinnville. But uh, with the introductions, I'll, I'll start with Drake Conti. Uh, I first met Drake uh, when he was inducted in the Hall of Fame. And I knew of Drake because his name came about all the time as a player. And then you hear alumni talk about Drake Conti. Uh, but uh, Drake uh, was a four-year letter winner here at Linfield. Uh, he ranked second all all-time career rushing here at Linfield with 20 uh, over 2,600 yards, and he once held a career scoring record 176 points set in 1976. All two-time All-Conference running back, a member of two Northwest Conference championship teams, and he was inducted in the Hall of Fame, the Athletics Hall of Fame, in 2012. Um, He's still working and he's an entrepreneur and designer. Um, he manufactured Levi's and cut loose with jeans and he designed the 1980 Winter Olympics uniforms for the Bob Sled and, and Luge teams. So grateful to have Drake here. And I got to know Drake more over the years because I did some old video for him. He wanted some uh, DVDs of the years he played. So we started talking last summer and we've had several conversations about the past and we look forward to hearing his story. And uh, Tony Taplin was my teammate. Uh, he played here uh, two years, uh, his junior, senior year. And he was a, a cornerback for us here at Linfield. And uh, like I mentioned, he was also my fraternity brother. We, uh, we pledged the same year in the spring of our, our junior years. I played 22 career games, uh, 97 tackles. Um, uh, he, he's a site supervisor for the San Francisco Renaissance overseeing purchasing materials. So, and he's coached AAU basketball teams with his kids and still involved in coaching. And then we got uh, Tremaine Payne. 
Um, you know, this is his 19th year as the assistant track coach here at Linfield. He graduated from Linfield in 90, 1998 with a bachelor's degree in physical education. Later, four years in football with 1,309 career rushing yards. And I used to watch Tremaine. Even after I had left Linfield and was teaching at Spray High School, I come to Linfield games and watch Tremaine play. And he was a bruiser. He was fun to watch, really fun to watch. Uh, earned his master's, master's degree in kinesiology from Humboldt State. And uh, he was uh, honored as the indoor assistant coach of the year for indoor track and field. Uh, he's from Klamath Falls and uh, graduated from Henley High School. Outside of coaching, he's currently teaching at uh, Patton Middle School. And Thomas Ford, who I had the pleasure of coaching and working with as uh, peers in, here at Linfield. He was a four-year letter winner in football and track, graduated in 2004. And he was co-captain of the 2004 uh, Division III National Championship team. Uh, rushed for 20, over 2,300 yards and 20 touchdowns during his career. And a single game rushing record holder, 237 yards versus Redlands. And he's, he's, had, he's got an extensive coaching career. He's coached at here at Linfield, Southeastern Oklahoma University, University of Puget Sound. He was a defensive coordinator there, head coach at Stadium High School, head coach at Simon Fraser University. And currently he's the, well, I don't know if it's still the quality control analysis, but I think it was more of the offensive side, right, Thomas? You're, you're an analyst for the offensive side? Yes, sir. Yeah. And it was fun watching Thomas play. Um, well, I, you know, I was off the line, offensive line coach and we worked with the running backs, obviously. But I'd never seen anyone make the cuts and moves that Thomas did while he was a player. Phenomenal, phenomenal player, no question. But more importantly, um, the relationship I have with these men are phenomenal. I'm just grateful that we are really good friends and it's a pleasure to have you guys here with us today, taking time off for your busy day. So again, welcome everyone and look forward to hearing our gentlemen speak of their experiences here at Linfield. So I'll start off with the first question. <clears throat> uh, curious to know your, your experience when you transitioned from your hometown to Linfield in McMinnville, Oregon. And you guys come from all different places, Oregon, Washington, California. And you know, with these questions, you're all welcome to answer them. Or if you don't want to answer them, you don't have to. I got easy ones and I got some tough ones. So we can start that off. Thomas, you want to start us off with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think for me, coming from the Seattle area, um, when I went and visited Linfield on my recruiting visit, I, I, just, I just fell in love with it. Uh, coach Losey was the head coach at the, head, at the, uh, head coach at the time. And I just remember I kind of got to my visit early and I was just kind of milling around the HHPA and then coach Losey actually like gave me a full out campus tour. And I, and I just thought that was pretty awesome that the head coach would take his time to do that. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really know much about McMinnville when I first came. Um, and when I arrived on campus in August of 2000, it was a, a bit of a culture shock outside of the campus um, coming from a you know pretty urban area and then going to more of a rural area was definitely different. Um, I remember really hanging and clinging pretty close to my teammates because I've just felt like this is a really different atmosphere. I, I almost feel a little out of place. I don't, I don't know if I, did I make the right decision. And so I really clung to my teammates and, and, and they made it a pretty easy transition um, after that first year. I, you know, I think just like a lot of college students and especially college athletes, you get homesick. And I was definitely one of those guys, you know, I, I, I had it all planned. I was going to transfer to central Washington and, and be with a bunch of my buddies. Uh, but at the end of that fall, that was the year. And, and if you guys have followed football at all, that was the miracle in the mud game against central of Iowa, where, where they won on a crappy call just to be nice about it. And I just remember all the older guys, the, the senior guys that, uh, really, I, I looked up to and had treated me really well, uh, being on the scout team and stuff as a freshman. And they just said, T4, man, this is going to be your guys. You, you guys are going to take us to the national championship. And you, you know, your group is going to be the guys. And, and I just felt like, like an extreme duty to stay. And, and as and uncomfortable as I first was, by the end of that first full year, I, I felt really comfortable at Linfield. I felt like, you know, especially on campus, 
there was a, a group of people, not just in football, but outside of football, that was a huge support system. And um, I think um, when it was all said and done, as, as uncomfortable as I was when I first came, I was probably just as comfortable by the time I left. I can jump in here. Um, the transition for me from high school to Linfield was a lot like Thomas's, except for um, I came from a, a pretty rural setting um, where at most of the time uh, I was only African-American uh, in my school setting most of the time. I did grow up a, a small portion of my life in Chicago where I'm from, born there. So I had um, an experience where uh, most everyone I was around, friends, family, school members uh, was African-American. So I had already kind of gone through that transition as far as uh, how I would feel in that setting where I was maybe quote unquote appeared to be different. So that was not a big deal, but I did go through um, an extreme amount of homesickness uh, for multiple different reasons early on and uh, felt pretty, pretty supported. Uh, obviously, uh, my roommate who's on this call was great to me during that time, real uh, understanding, kind of calming uh, voice. Um, so I was able to make it through that portion of the process because you know, when you first come on campus, you're used to being really good, being the guy right away. And that was not the case. Um, there was a lot of, um, I think my first week on campus, we had like 25 running backs. So just getting uh, the opportunity to get some respect, get enough reps to get some respect was, was, uh, was tough. My recruiting trip, though, is where I did fall in love with Linfield. Linfield was not a school that was on my map for any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I came last minute um, over spring break, and there was no one on campus. Um, I think there was um, one guy, I think, with defensive end. I think it was, uh, it was Tim France, maybe, if that's the name. Doug, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was a DN. He was out on the field working out all by himself. I found myself pretty impressed with that, knowing that it was spring break and figured he should have been somewhere else having fun, but he was out working. And um, Ed Langsdorf was the head coach at the time, and he was probably coming off of his 837th knee surgery. And uh, you just couldn't help but like him. He, he pulled me in his office, and we had a, a, a really long conversation uh, made me watch film with him, um, but he couldn't really walk very well at the time. And the person that was recruiting me was uh, Chris Casey, who's now obviously at George Fox, head coach there. And uh, my uh, relationship with him was was really good through the process. But the one thing that drew me in was uh, every conversation I had with Winfield football at that time was all based on what type of person they thought I was and what type of person they thought I could be. And then the player part always came second in the conversation. And uh, I was really interested in that for whatever reason. So I was drawn based on that. I felt like people cared what was going to happen um, in the next four or five years. And I really had a, felt a strong obligation to graduate um, because not many people in my family have accomplished that, uh, going to college, number one, and finishing. So um, I felt like this was a good place, and that's how I ended up here, was the relationship with those men. Um, and there's a lot of funny stories that go along with that, but um, being a, in, the, in the early 90s, we were not allowed to uh, cheer for the University of Miami. I want to get that on the table. So uh, I was a big Hurricane fan, me and my good buddy, Dedrick Faison. Uh, we were Hurricanes, right? And uh, Coach Casey used to make me take my Hurricanes jacket off before I could come in his office and talk to him. But I would take that jacket off every day and stop by and see him for a few minutes and, and chat him up. And, and that's, that's how we ended up here. So my transition, a roundabout way, it was easy. Uh, most of it was easy but it was based on the support that came from teammates, roommates, 
um, and the people that I met were very welcoming and, and made it a good place to be. So. Thanks, Tremaine. Drake, you on mute. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you see me? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. I'm from Pacoima, California. I come out of a large tradition of high school with a big tradition of athletes, Anthony Davis, Charles, Charles White, uh, who else? Uh, Gary Matthews played for the Giants, Rookie of the Year and all that. Just a number of folks. Uh, but I, I, heard, if I first heard of Linfield, uh, I had just finished playing in the All-Valley uh, All All-Star Game in uh, basically in August. And I still didn't have a college to go to. And then our varsity baseball coach asked me, would I be interested to in go into Linfield because he had a he had a he had a brother-in-law who was a professor at Linfield, and he, and he talked about the school and he knew about the whole tradition of Linfield and everything. And I said, sure. Within a week, films were sent to Coach Rutschman. Uh, the following, uh, so in two weeks' time, I was on the road coming to Linfield. Had no had no idea where I was going, and I was in my Volkswagen square back. Let me see if I can get a picture of it and show you. I don't know if you can see that. But I was in my Volkswagen square back on my way and it broke down in Northern California. So I jumped on a Greyhound bus with all my little stuff and loaded it up. And the bus took me to McMinnville, Oregon. I got off the Greyhound bus and practice had already started. So I was late getting there. And uh, I walked from downtown, left my stuff at the bus station and walked from downtown. And I was like, whoa, Mayberry. I couldn't believe it. You know, and I walked across the, the, the bridge, the creek, and everything onto, over to the campus, and they were out there practicing. So I walked out on the field, and when I got over to where the coaches were, I told them who I was, and the first person who walked up to me was Coach Rutschman. And he looked at me and he said, get a haircut. And he, went, <clears throat> he was grunting and groaning, and was kicking the ground and walked away from me. And me being, I mean, I, you know, I'm coming from Pacoima, you got to be kind of hardcore growing up. And I was ready to like, hey, give him a few words of my own. But he, uh, then Coach Knight walked up and said, excuse me, brother, but go ahead, don't pay any attention to him. You know, he doesn't know what's going on. And man, I'm telling you, I think I was more of a culture shock to Linfield than I was to, than it was on me. Because when, when I got there, uh, this is me. I had a big fro sticking out like, like the Jackson 5. It was out there. And they had never seen nothing like it. And uh, uh, it was, you know, it was, I think it was more of a shock to, to, to the whole town and to, and to Meg Mill and the school. Uh, it was more of a culture shock because, you know, I was a pretty easygoing guy, even though it didn't seem like it. You know, I was like, hey, you know, let it, I just let it roll off. And I said, oh, they just tripping, you know. So I just kept on rolling. It was like, and coming to Luther was like a big adventure for me. And so, you know, so it, it turned out that it kind of worked out. First day of practice, I went to practice, and after, and I, you know, I was, and oh, the other thing was, in high school, I was a wide receiver. I was all LA City, uh, third team, probably, probably the fifth best receiver in, in LA City that graduated that year, and uh, out of LA City schools. And when I came to Linfield, first thing they did when when I went to practice, I lined up with the receivers and. Coach said, no, no, come on over here. You're going you're gonna to be a running back. But I never played running back before in my life. So it was a, the biggest chain cultural shock to me was the football part of it, playing as a running back coming from wide receiver where there may be only two, one or two people covering you, where then I'm, now I'm facing the whole team of 11. And I'm like, whoa, it was a big shot. And every time I ran the ball, I'm going to tell you, I was scared as shit. <laughs> but the thing was, I guess because of my speed and whatever, I, you know, I was first and like again, like first day of practice, I was beating the quarterbacks to the holes. And then they so coach Rutgers said, you gotta slow down. And and so after that, they I guess they tried to figure out how to make the offense work for me for what I was bringing, but I never played running back. So, you know, that was like a big shock to me. 
so then, you know, they had this big policy where when you went out for sports, you had to get a cold bodice or a bowl cut. There was no facial hair or anything like this. So now I had this big afro. So I so I, so so they so one day I went, so I said, well, I'm gonna get it cut. So I went, so I went to Portland. I got my I went to Portland. Uh, one of the players took me to Portland, one of the brothers that lived from Portland is at Linfield. He took me there. And I got my hair cut. But you know, me get for me to get my hair cut was like I go in, it's they were just shaping up my afro. So so I thought that I had them cut it down, but it was still it was still big. So when I when I came to practice, Coach Nordstrom was mad because I hadn't, you know, I still had an afro and it was sticking out the back of my helmet and he was mad. So what I did was so then Coach Knight said, Well, you gotta do something, you gotta do something. So what I did was I braided my hair. And once I braided my hair, it changed the you know, I I it was it was acceptable to Coach Rutschman. Uh so that's how that's how that's how I went uh, my first year with my hair braided. And then, but you know, on the weekends I unbraid and, and it'd be back out there and I'd be walking around, but I'd always get it braided for before Sunday meetings before we had so that it'd be braided back so he wouldn't be pissed. <laughs> so that was like, you know, the big, I guess, culture shock you want to say. But I mean, I adapted to the whole uh, rural area, the whole, you know, countryside and the whole the whole thing of, of Linfield. I, you know, to me, it was it was kind of like it was kind of like parts of where I grew up in Pacoima. If that was still rural. There's a lot of uh, orchards and farmland and things like that. And you know, and we, you know, when I when we were younger, we used to go greyhound hunting. We used to go jackrabbit hunting in Bakersfield with greyhounds. So you know, we were like country. We kind of country. There's a big dam up there where we are. We used to go fishing and do all and camping and stuff, stuff like that. So that kind of thing was, you know. You know, I got, I mean, I wasn't too, it wasn't too much of a culture shock going to Linfield and the, co you know, and going to college, it wasn't that bad either. But I think it was more of a, it was more of a shock to me when I played football coming from running from wide receiver to a running back. So, you know, and it's good to see Ford, I guess, because you broke my record for a single game rushing, which was 229. So you got what, two? I know. I, hey, Drake, I, Drake, I was, when, so, when I that found good. out that you were on the I call, man, I, I was really excited because I had never met you before. And I know during my career, I always saw your name and I, I was I was chasing your name for four years. And mm. I, I thought I was going to get there, but I kind of got banged up my senior year and didn't get to play in all of the games. But um, it, it is a pleasure to actually finally meet you, man. And and to me, I mean, I, it, whether you know this or not, but to me, you're a legend. You know, I mean, oh. you're a guy that that I, I always looked up to as a player, and and I'm glad I finally got a chance to meet you, even if it was a a few years past my prime. <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah, because I mean, you know, and I and I, as long as I played football through Pop Warner in high school, I always started. So it, that was, you know, that. My, you know, I guess I had the kind of attitude that I was going to start wherever I was going to play. So that wasn't a problem. But then uh, from there, as far as academic wise, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what have you. And so I ended up doing, ended up being doing a business major, but I had a minor in home ec. And so Coach Knight and I, we sat down one day to figure out what I was going to do. And he asked me what I was interested in. And I said, I told him I was interested in interior designing. So he said, well, and I had already taken an art class. I was thinking about taking an art class. So he said, well, you might want to take this applied design. But I thought it was an art class, but it turned out to be a home ec course. <laughs> and the labs had to do with sewing. So that's how the whole sewing thing got started. And from there, uh, I did the labs. And my first product, first thing I made was a robe in the labs for the sewing part. And then I needed a traveling bag for the for the games so I made a tote bag out of some old blue jeans and stuff I had and then and when I got to when I got to the bus for everybody for us to get on the travel everybody asked me where I got it and I said I made it so everybody needed to stop making one so everybody was giving me their old jeans and I was making them bags and then I had me a little hustle so I was starting to make <laughs> money because you know how, how, how you are you're broke when you're a college student so I, I was making money but then one of the guys on the team said, hey, I'm doing my internship at the state penitentiary. I can rig the bid for all the blue jeans, all the old denim worn jeans. So we rigged the bid. I got it. I got them for like 60 bucks. 
and uh, I had a I had a whole dorm room full of jeans, boxes of jeans. And then from there, I just started making bags, and it kind of took off on me. I was making bags, and uh, uh, after the season was over, season was over, and I would go up to up to Portland to flea markets, and I would sell up to flea markets. So I, I, was, I was I had me a little income coming in. It was really good. And then because I played because I was playing football, I guess they had heard about my sewing. And so they came and did a story on me, and that kind of just, from there, things just blew up. I mean, things just took off from there. They did a big article on me in the Oregonian uh, Sunday paper in their living section or something. It was like a three-page spread, and that was in there. And then I got some write-ups in some national magazines, and then CBS came out and did a story on me, on my sewing and stuff in my bags and everything. So it, it really took off, <laughs> you know. And then from there, uh, I did an internship with Pendleton Woolen Mills in Portland. And then, uh, you know, then I, and when I graduated from there, I went on to design school at Fashion Institute in LA. And I, I did my 16 months there and got my certificate. And then I worked for a company called Broderick. They made team wear, gym wear, competition, competition uniforms for uh, the collegiate sports, men and women. And, uh, our marketing guy got us the bid to design, to, to do the bobsled and luge team for the US uh, Winter Olympics, 1980. Oh. And so I designed the bobsled and luge team Olympi uh, uniforms. I've got one here, I should have got it out, but I was rushing, but I have it here at the house. And, uh, and then, uh, and then so, so then I was, uh, I was fortunate to go to the Olympics. I, was, I spent a month up there. We went up there, we had a house we set up uh, sewing machines and everything. I did all the final fittings on the uniforms with the athletes. And then I started collecting pins and I have a pin collection that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so that, you know, I got a pin collection uh, on hats, on my hat. And I, and I was able to trade with the athletes from the, you know, uh, so they have, and all the athletes have the real good pins. So I, I got a really good collection. And then, you know, then I, then I worked in the LA garment district for about, down in LA for about another seven years. And then finally I got, I applied and got hired at, uh, at Levi's and I did a, and I, I, I did a walk-in interview. They had walk-in interviews on Tuesday and I walked in with, and I had on my portfolio and everything with me. And I met with the guy and he, and I told him what I wanted to do and what I was looking for. Basically, then after the interview, he just said, well, you got, you got time to hang around? I said, yeah, cause I'm gonna take you and meet some people. I met a, a couple of different people in different departments and uh, uh, then they said they'd get back to me and they got back to me. Then they, I got hired as a pattern maker at, Le at, at Le Levi's. So I was a pattern maker for five years, but then I got over to the design side. Now this is where the Linfield, let me say this. This is how Linfield is such a little college, but there's people everywhere at Linfield, everywhere. It turned out when I wanted to go over to start designing for Levi's, the merchandise manager, his name was John Ermentinger, and he had went to Linfield and he was in my class and I didn't know it. So I got hired by John in his department, uh, which was a silver tab department, uh, designing for Levi's. So, I mean, let's just tell you how small the world is. And like, I got stories about Levi people because with Levi's, I traveled all over the world, uh, Europe, Asia, Indonesia, South America, Central America, Canada. And wherever I'd go, I'd run into somebody who knew about Levi's or they had some, I mean, who went to Linfield or who knew somebody from Linfield. So that's how, how, how small world it is in the Linfield world. But, uh, and then, you know, I worked in that, so, Levi's afforded me the chance to travel all over the world and see all kinds of things and experience a lot of things. And then uh, I left Levi's and then uh, I worked for another company, a women's apparel company called Cut Loose. And I worked with them for 20 years. And then now, and I took this past October, I retired. So I'm retired. So that's what, I'm, that's what I've been doing. And then me and my wife, Key, we're opening up an amatory infusion center. So that's we're in the process of that, and that's almost done. Uh, almost finished with construction, and everything. So that's moving right along too. Yeah, so awesome. that's where I'm. That's where I'm at, and that's me, basically. Sorry. <laughs> that's awesome, Drake. I, you know, I got a blue. It's amazing that um, 
you meet Linfield alumni across the nation. You know, right. in an extra championship in 2004, my family, we had we extended our stay and stayed on the East Coast. And we were taking the kids to Washington, D.C. And um, someone, I was wearing that red jacket, you know, Thomas, we had that has Linfield. Oh, yeah. And uh, I hear people going, hey, Linfield, there, you know, there's, there's people in Linfield all over. So, yeah, I mean, you know, in conversations I'd have with people, I just run to people. And they say they went to Linfield or they had a nephew or they had a brother who went there. I, like my daughter, she was, she was, uh, she got her PhD, but when she got her master's in law, she went to school in Ireland, I mean, Scotland at a university called Dundee. So we were going to go to the Loch, so we were on our way to the Loch Ness, to, to, to tour the, for the Loch, Loch Ness monster. And when we stopped at a cafe, there was a lady that came in and it was raining and she came in and she sat near us. So we got to, so she said, where are you from? And we got to talking. She was from, she was from, she was there from Corvallis uh, doing a, high, a a walking tour of, uh, of Scotland. And I mean, of, yeah, Scotland. And um, she, uh, she told me that, and I told her, I was, well, I, you know, I went to school at Enfield in Agnesville. She said, oh, I have a nephew that goes there. So that should show you how it's a small world, how you run into people. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hey, the, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, Linfield has, uh, has been an NAIA institution for years, you know, associated with athletics. And then we transitioned in the late 90s, probably right after Tremaine was playing, right, Tremaine? Probably the late 90s, and then we transitioned to the NCAA Division Three. So yeah, now it was our last year. My last, my last playing year was the last transition year. Okay. So the question comes up is, you know, how did, <clears throat> you know, how did your decision, uh, how did that impact your decision to come to Linfield? You know, when you're NEIA, Tremaine, you know, Tony, my teammate was the same way. And of course, Drake was in the NEIA compared to Thomas when you were division three, you know, and see, cause things changed, whether it be from admissions to, you know, the financial aspect, but how did it impact your decision? Was, was that question for just in general? Yeah, in general for you guys. I mean, what, um, anyone to answer that? I mean. Well, I know for me, uh, it was an AI situation when we when I came in and um, um, that was a big deal because at the time, I think financially we were still getting what, um, you know, was probably considered athletic money. I don't know, but um, it helped financial aid a little bit. And for me, that process was uh, important. Um, I probably was like a lot of kids and assumed that I would get to play for a scholarship someplace. And when those opportunities came and went, I was looking and searching. And I had another school that <clears throat> wasn't an AIA school at the time, uh, was a big rival of ours at the time also, but I'm not gonna say any names, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, the way it worked out, there was a, a minority scholarship um, that I had uh, acquired. Um, along with a, um, a local hospital scholarship that was a significant amount of money per year um, in school. Um, but this other school in question, I would have gone there for about $50 a year, um, but it wasn't Linfield. And um, I had come, I'd come to Linfield, like I said, and had a really good experience when there was no one on campus. So I figured that it would only get better um, so that's how it impacted me. It was more so it was a financial thing. And then I, I do remember transitioning from a player to coach and how that conversation always went with kids when they kind of bring up the, the scholarship wor word and you kind of go, well, it's all need based, you know, it's, it's need based. And in my situation coming up as a kid, need based probably would have worked just the same. Um, cause we needed that financial help to get to school. And the price tag at Linfield was uh, significantly less in those days, still expensive. Um, but I think the sticker shock now might be part of the thing that you battle more than anything else. Um, so for me, NAIA was a positive at the time. Then scholarship wasn't a thing. Um, and so moving forward, 
NCAA, I would have to let, you know, Thomas or someone else. Yeah. Ask the question. yeah it's, 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 it's funny that you mentioned that. Cause you know, like Tremaine talked about, I, I'm also a first generation college student. So I was kind of the, I have two younger brothers and I was kind of like the Guinea pig. We, we didn't know anything about recruiting. Um, at this time, like as I was kind of a junior and senior in high school, my parents had also got a divorce. So I was, you know, mom, she, she's from the Philippines originally came to the States to study. And so she didn't have any idea about financial aid. She didn't know anything about division one, division two, II, division three. Like we knew what the Huskies were, right. Cause we're from Seattle. We knew go dogs. Right. But, but we didn't really know anything in terms of the differences. And during my recruitment, I was recruited pretty heavily by two in-state schools, uh, Central Washington, and then uh, the now defunct Western Washington RIP football program. But uh, both of those schools offered me very minimal athletic scholarship. I think both of them offered me like $500. And when we started crunching the numbers, because I was a first generation student, because I was a minority, and because I had really good grades, Linfield's financial aid package was extremely competitive with those other two schools. And I think for me, the, the decision was less about, hey, do I want to play division two or division three? But it was more about where can I go and I know I'm going to win. I, I came from a high school that didn't win very often. We, we just didn't win. And I was a, a all conference player for them, both my varsity years. And then I started as a sophomore, but I, we didn't win and, I, and I'm a really competitive guy and I know the guys that coach, coach me probably are laughing because they know how competitive I could be but with that being said I just wanted to win and I just looked at Linfield's history of winning I mean obviously we know about the streak you know they were coming off a really good year in, in 1999 you know PLU had just won the national championship and, I, and I'm thinking in my head I'm like if these guys can win then I know Linfield can win because they've been doing it just as long if not longer <laughs> And so the, the decision for me was probably less about uh, what division it was, but more about getting a great education, having it be affordable, right? It, it wasn't like it was uh, easy for my family. We did have to take out loans and things like that, but because it was affordable, it was in the same realm as these other two schools that were recruiting me. And then obviously some other Northwest conference schools, it was, a, it was like a no brainer. You know, I, I can win, I can get a great education. I'm not that far away from home. And you know, at the end of the day, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna put me in a situation where I'm never gonna recover financially. So it was, it was um, kind of all in all, all signs kind of pointed to to Linfield because it was kind of the best of, of all the world in terms of the decision making process and the things that we were looking at while making that decision. So, yeah, man, I mean, Division Three, I, I didn't really think too much of it back in the day, and really still don't. I mean, I, I think. At the end of the day for us, and, and I tell a kid the same thing to this day, if you find your fit, it shouldn't really matter what, what level that is. Can you make it work financially? Does it fit you academically? And is it the best fit for you? And that, you know, all those things really checked out for me in Linfield. One of the things uh, to add on to that too, um, one of the things that I remember specifically was um, something I'd never heard of before as a young kid. Um, and that was the con conversation I remember having with uh, Coach Langsdorf about uh, network. Um, he, he used the word network a bunch. And he's like, we got a great network. And, and, and as I um, kind of clued in on the conversation when, it was, when I wasn't thinking like an 18-year-old and I was listening to this guy um, talk to me, um, I put that two and two together. And it goes back to something that Drake was saying earlier. Um, and Doug said earlier about everywhere you go, there seems to be a, a, a Linfield connection. And uh, as I've gotten older and gone through this process, um, recruiting kids, coaching kids, um, and being, being at a, spending some time at another university for a short period of time, I realized that that network Linfield was selling at the time was a real thing um, because numerous times over the years um, I've run into people that have uh, been on this campus um, that have been helpful um, I've run into uh, colleagues um, that came before me um, and they've all reached their hand out to make sure that uh, things go in the right direction uh, because 
of where we were from. And, you know, I kind of followed, um, you know, I, I said, I'm a hurricane fan. I always watched that uh, North Carolina basketball. And that was always something that I remember picking up from uh, hearing Dean Smith talk a bunch was about the network. And if you look back at how all those North Carolina guys always reach back and pick up those younger generation guys and the alumni games and those things. And um, so the network piece of that was something that was important in the conversation to get me here. And I know too, you know, you hear, you hear it the whole time you're there, but it's almost like as soon as you leave, you really realize it. In fact, my first uh, coaching job outside of Linfield. So I spent two years at Linfield coach with coach hire coach of running backs. And my first job that I got outside of Linfield was at Southeastern Oklahoma. And I remember, oh, there goes Coach Smith popping on right now, right on cue, Coach Smith. But I remember I had a conversation with Coach Smith and, and I had a, an opportunity at Southeastern Oklahoma. And he told me, you need to go and, and branch out and, and, and do something different outside of the Linfield circle if you really want to do this. And the whole point of me saying that is the reason why I was even a candidate for that position was because that offensive coordinator at the time, really good friends with the defensive coordinator at Mary Harden Baylor. And we had just played them a few years, you know, a few years ago in the national championship. And he said, if you can get a Linfield guy, you want a Linfield guy. And that was literally the difference between myself and like the 90 other resumes they got for that position is because I played it and coached at Linfield. And so again, that, that connection and that network definitely runs deep. And, and for all you student athletes that are on, you'll continue to see that as you, as your days go by. I know, I know my former track teammate, Joni Claypool, you could, you can speak to that too as well. Good to see you, Joni. <laughs> Thomas, a classic story, same scenario. When I went down to Humboldt State, the thing that was a separating factor was uh, the head coach at the time was actually the son-in-law of a, a longtime coach at Central Washington, and he hated Linfield. <laughs> but loved having the fact that he was going to have a Linfield guy on his staff and that was kind of the, the, the tiebreaker was the Linfield thing. Now, I did get kicked out of the office a couple of times for wearing a Linfield shirt <laughs> and was no longer allowed to wear anything in the weight room that had an L on it. But I pushed that envelope a few different times. But that said, um, I can 100% attest to what you just said was that that was the tiebreaker um, was that lineage that we all kind of come from and that we're still building as a group, but um, it was a, it was definitely a tiebreaker. Okay. As far as myself being recruited, I, I wasn't recruited. <laughs> my, my guess, me going to Linville was a leap of faith, really. I knew that I had to get out of Pacoima because from, from looking at what the history athletes that came out of San Fernando and Pacoima, they ended up doing nothing, you know, and there were a lot of good athletes, even better than Anthony Davis and Charles White. I mean, but they never did anything but with it. And uh, so I had the mindset that I wanted to go away to college and I wanted to go out of town. I didn't want to go to local JC or anything like that. I wanted to get out of it. And when the opportunity came, I just took a leap of faith and I went and I came. You know, I knew nothing about Linfield or anything like that. <laughs> they found money for me and I, you know, I was able to go, go to school and I didn't have a problem, but you know, it was a total leap of faith because I knew I wanted to get out and go to school and play somewhere, but it wasn't, you know, and I, and I didn't care where, you know, so I, just, you know Linfield, I guess fell in my lap and I, I took it and ran with it. And it turned out to be the best, one of the best things I've done in my life. So. And that's, how, that, that's, that's, that's where I'm at on that. And, uh, and I found some pictures. I don't know if you can see it on my phone. That's the baseball. Oh, your pins. That's the hat I had. All the Olympic pins. Yeah. That's my Olympic credentials that I wore. They got me in and out of all the events free. I saw everything. I got to see the big hockey game with the Russians and the Americans. I mean, I, I saw everything. And so that was, that was a great, 
experience and then we'll see what else. Here's the, here's one of the outfits that we designed uh, for them. There's the windbreaker and the, and the uh, outer suit that went over the competition uniform. And then this is a picture of the competition uniform. I don't know if you can see it or not. That's a that's one of the uniforms. So the picture froze. You know, those are the things that, that when I went to the Olympics and I, I mean I had a great time. Everything you know with that credential, like you know, huh? Uh, what's that? Your your picture froze here a little. Back okay, off. and I got I got to go get my cord. I got to plug in because I'm losing power. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. You talk about those are some 2021 problems right there. Now I tell you what. The Zoom, man, I, I've been caught on that a couple times. Oh, I got, I got no power. I'm about to be out. <laughs> well, but next thing, uh, question I want to ask you guys, uh, you know, you guys know I played on Linfield too, being from Hawaii. Um, you know, I was lucky that the years I played, like on the old line, <clears throat> including the tight end, four of the five starters we were from Hawaii, or four of the six. So we had a huge population of Hawaii student athletes here. Um, you know, my, my, my next question is, uh, you know, what were some of the challenges? And I know it's different when we're on campus with the football program, and it's a little bit challenging in the classroom, and of course, challenging when you're in McMinnville, and then of course, challenge when you leave McMinnville. Um, I had no car, we never really left McMinnville, you know, unless I hung out with some of the older guys and we traveled to Salem or to Portland, but that was a rarity. But what were some of the challenges you may have had? Uh, as a student athlete on campus? And, and, and how did you manage that, uh, being a person of color on, on here at Linfield? I, I, I know one, one thing, Doug, that we had talked about last time I, I was able to join you guys that I hadn't really thought about, but since then have given a lot more thought about it. One thing that I thought was a bit challenging was when you know, you're, you're an African-American on campus that doesn't have a lot of African-Americans, you almost, carry this burden to like speak for an entire group of people, right? And so when you're in class and you might be the only black kid in class, you feel like every answer you're giving is, is an answer for all the black people, which is, is very difficult and, and in a lot of ways unfair. Um, and, I, and I didn't really think about how much that affected me until after that conversation. And, and now that I'm able to really look at it from the whole, I did feel that pressure. And it, and it was, a, and it was, it was one of those things that was, um, you, you just, you, you almost had to be careful about what you said. You, I just know that during those days, you, you didn't want to, you know, for lack of a better term, you want to be the angry black guy, right? If, and I know that there was probably some things that were said, not, not necessarily to me or about me, but in front of me, that if those things were said today, I, there's no way I would not say anything. Right. And, and, and at that point, I didn't want to be I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to I didn't want to be known as someone that was you know angry or militant. And if I could obviously if I could change it, I, I would have done something. I would have said something or helped try to educate those people around me, because um, I know at my adult age now I, I will. You know, those same if those same comments, even if they're very small and, and probably what would be called now microaggressions. I wouldn't have let those things slide, right? I wouldn't have let a, a joke that was stereotypical about all of black people go by without saying, hey, that's not okay, right? And I feel like when you're in that moment and at that time, I, I didn't. Maybe, maybe, maybe I didn't have the strength to do it. Maybe I, I wasn't mature enough to do it, but I, but I felt like I had, a, like I said, I was carrying the weight of every black person in America on Linfield's campus. And the, the good part was, you know, I had a, a good group of, of, of Hawaiian students that I was really close with, a group, good group of African-American students I was really close with. So I felt like those experiences probably were lessened because I was around them a lot. Uh, but I do know for a fact that when, when you stepped off that campus, it, it, was, it was very different. Now the whole weight of the world was on your shoulders. And I wanted to make sure I didn't do anything that could be even displayed as negative because I didn't want that connotation to be attached to myself, any of my teammates, or anyone that looked like me. I told this story last time, but uh, I'll tell it again for the folks that didn't hear it. 
I will never forget going into Walmart and, they, and I can't remember the exact term they used, but it was like a code. It was like code blue or whatever it was. And I thought at first that was like, it was, that can't be, they can't be talking about me. Right? And then I started talking to one of my other teammates, Rodney Cook, and he, he told me that the same thing happened to him. So a few weeks later, him and I went together and we heard the exact same code as, as we're walking into the store. And it was very obvious, very clear that whatever this code was meant two black kids were in the store. And I probably had never felt that uncomfortable in my entire life up to that point. I'm, I'm 18 years old. You know, obviously when, when you grow up as an African-American, you're going to face racism, period. It is what it is. And I've seen that before, but I hadn't seen it so up close and personal where it was like, oh, they really are paying more attention to us walking into this store. You know, I, I had never heard that message in Seattle, <laughs> right? And so uh, again, I do think there was a, a bit of that weight carried as an African-American student on that campus but definitely more so when I stepped off the campus. And well, my experience was, well, one, uh, we had the largest population of African-Americans, I believe ever at Linfield when I was there. It was about 78 black students and 15, 15 of them were female. So we had a large population. So we had a Linfield African-American community on campus. And, you know, we had, uh, we had a black dean, Barry Tucker, and then later was John Lee. So, you know, and if somebody got out of line, they got checked, period. So I don't know if they thought we were, they were scared of us or whatever, but if anybody said something wrong, whatever, they got checked. <laughs> and that's, you know, and that, cause you know, that's a period when I grew up, when I was there was, you know, I'm coming out of, out of uh, Southern California and there were, there were students from Oakland and stuff. And that was the Black Panthers and that, you know, so, Nobody, no, I mean, people, I guess they watch what they said around us or whatever, because they got a line and said something wrong, they got checked, period, you know? And plus, you know, I was fortunate to have a car. I finally got my car fixed and brought up. Uh, and the, another gentleman who went to the, came from the same place, Gerald King, who ran track, he had a car and uh, Carl Shaw, I don't know if you guys heard of Carl Shaw, who ran track for 440, uh, he had a car. So we had a few cars around campus, and Gerald, Gerald had cousins that lived in Portland. So, you know, we would leave on, we'd go on the weekends, you know, we'd go up to Portland and his cousin Johnny would take us around and we learned, me, we learned Portland and how to get around in Portland. So we had outlets to go to besides at Linfield, but the population on campus, we had a large uh, African-American population and, you know, everybody watched out for everybody. And, you know, and when we also, you know, we had, along with whole wines they had a large population too so but we got along with everybody and you know i got along with everybody I, you know kind of i guess you know i don't know because i played football and i was doing all these other things i didn't really feel that going on you know you know with you know with all, with all the things that were going on with articles written on me and stuff like that i guess that we were kind of breaking down some barriers and breaking down some stereotypes too I'd have to <clears throat> agree with Thomas a little bit on the standpoint of um, different things would come your way. And it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of resources in terms of how to deal uh, with, with the, the different challenges. Um, campus, in terms of being on campus, was always a pretty safe place. I never had any feeling of being challenged, um, you know, it was more so, again, off campus, there were some issues that you would run into from time to time. Um, but on campus, being um, insulated by uh, the HHPA um, and the coaches staff and, and the admin at the time, it was pretty much, you had a pretty pretty safe place to fall if you, if you were gonna fall. There was an intense feeling um, that you probably need to keep your nose clean um, and not in a not in a negative way I mean it was just I just felt like it was in our best interest to, to keep it together and for myself um, I, I I was around for the kind of the resurgence of the BSU and so um, 
we were a smaller population. There was probably 20 of us total on campus, all in a few basketball, some football guys. Um, and, and we were, I, like I said, it started with, uh, uh, you know, Billy Thomas was a guy that was a, a big deal in that um, before myself. And so I, I leaned on that and became sergeant at arms at one year. So I was kind of the enforcer slash, uh, you know, go knock on the door when it was time for meetings. Um, and, and you kind of might, you might get dragged out to the meeting. I don't know. We'll keep that on the, the back burner, but, um, and then became president for, um, I forget what year now, 96, 97, somewhere around there. And, and so, um, basically just trying to be a voice of reason and, um, keep everybody in line because in my mind, um, the most important thing was to finish. Um, we have to finish. And I remember having a conversation with a, another African-American student um, as I graduated and he was kind of struggling and we talked and that was the conversation is you got to finish. Once you finish what you've started, it'll be okay. And, and that, that was always my mentality was, if I'm going to start it, I'm going to finish it. And that was with an argument. And that was with a talk. That was with a workout. Um, and that was with a friendship, whatever. That was just kind of my mentality. So. I see, Jane, we got time for one more question. I'm going to kind of tie two together. Maybe we could do one more quick question. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, as I, we said, we're here for an hour. And so if you need to go, feel free. Um, but if you'd like to stay, of course, we'd love to have everyone stay as long as you want. Well, I'm going to tie two together so maybe we can answer both of those together. Uh, being Black History Month, um, one, the first part is, uh, who's your favorite Black historical figure? And then favorite memory at Linfield? <laughs> I know you got a lot, Tremaine. <laughs> Thomas, I'm sure we got a lot, man. Yeah, that, that, that's tough to, to nail one uh, best memory down. I'm, I'm going to go with one that um, probably most wouldn't ha have thought. Um, it's, it's one that does not come from football, actually. It comes from the track. So when I was a freshman, you know, I was, you know, I redshirted. I started playing corner, and then I was like, I can't play corner. I'm a running back. And uh, I went over to the offensive side of the ball, and, you know, I, at the time we had David Russell, Marty Williams. These guys are like bigger dudes, right? And, and so I'm like, I got to get bigger, right? And so I, I'm thinking I got to get bigger. So I go home um, during Jan term. I didn't do Jan term my first year. And I was just going to hit the weights and I was going to eat and I was going to get bigger. Well, when I got back in February, Co Coach Losey saw him and he's like, T4? Now, now remember now, we, 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 need you, we need that speed now. And that was his nice, really nice way of saying, dude, you're fat. And so I, I'll never forget, but I, but I went over to Coach Kilgore's office and you know, he, we had already talked about doing track and I told him I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. And, and then I, and I came into his office. I said, coach, I really want to run. Can I, can I come out? And he was like, of course you can. You know, if you guys know Gary at all, he's, he's like the best coach ever. And, and he, he was really kind to me, but I was flat out out of shape. And the first few meets, I'm like running like 11 sevens, 11 nines, you know, in high school, I was like a, you know, a solid 11, three guy. And so I'm like, I got, I got to do something. I, I, maybe I can't do this. And this, the reason why this is the best and most favorite memory of, of Linfield is I just remember Gary telling me, Hey, just, just stay the course. Trust me. You're, you're going to be fine. And as a freshman, we go to the conference track meet and I'm thinking I'm not even going to make it out of the heat, let alone make the final. Right. And I, and I end up getting, I think sixth or seventh in the final. And I will, and I'll just, I'll just never forget that because Gary, believed in me way more than I believed in myself. And that had not happened often. I, if you guys know me, especially on the football field, I thought pretty highly of myself. Uh, but, <laughs> but it was just that, uh, that story was probably stands out the most for me because it was just, I felt like it was like Linfield in a nutshell. You have incredible support, you have incredible resources, and you have people that flat out believe in you. And, and that story will always stick out to me. And you know, obviously, I had a, a pretty decent track career from, from there. You know, I was a, a, a part of a couple championship relays and 
made the final every year except for one and in the hundred. And so again, that that story really sticks out because I, yeah, I feel like exemplifies the, the Linfield family for sure. You, you got robbed on that final. That I, was I know, I know, I know, T. It's, it's okay, though. It's okay. Uh, I haven't forgot. I, I, I was there. I was there. A coach was kind of mad because I had actually, that was the, the PLU meeting. Their timing system went out, and I probably ran the best race I did, I had all year. And I'm like, I, I didn't make the final? You're kidding me. But anyway, the good story was Gary being an awesome coach and awesome support. And again, I think that kind of speaks volumes and exemplifies everything the Cat Dome's all about. For me, um, well, I got a million, I, I got a million stories of things that were awesome um, and things that uh, I'm really proud of. Um, but like I said, my mentality has always been, you know, finish what you start. Um, and so for me, when I look back at Linfield and I, like I said, I had some, some severe homesickness early on um, for multiple reasons, but the uh, giving credit where credit is due, you know, when you got to finish something, sometimes you need somebody to give you a helping hand, give you a, a kind word, or just fix your problems. Um, I had needed all that. So um, to, to the, the, to the, the thing that sticks out to me the most were, Two of the coaches gave me their time. Um, and one was Coach Smith um, when he was a young, young coach and I was a young player getting my first uh, real action, um, didn't play well, got my butt chewed out probably for the first time ever by a coach because that was the first time that I wasn't very good. Um, and Coach Smith, being a linebacker coach, saw me every day in practice and whatnot. And I was a, a redshirt freshman at the time. I think it was 1994. And just pulled me aside. Defensive coach, no real use for me as a player. Um, couldn't help him. I wasn't moving the linebacker. But took the time out of his, his time right after the game to give me a, a talk and I can't remember what he said, I'm just being honest, but it worked, kind of recharged my juices and was able to improve from there. And the second one, giving credit where credit is due, I'm probably still taking classes at Linfield. Um, if it's not for Gary, um, I walked into his office switching advisory uh, advisors midway through uh, college when you're probably getting to the point where you need to start getting ready to graduate. And I remember him cracking a joke about me not graduating for about 10 years of the, the classes I was taking. And he was full at the time and uh, didn't, didn't really wasn't taking any more advisees, but um, took the time to uh, clean up my mess and get me back on schedule. Now that did require one, um, fall semester 1996 where I needed to take anatomy and phys at the same time and I'm not that smart but I made it through I was a lot of um, uh, what are those things called the, the post-it notes because if you've seen a Linfield College football playbook and then you try to walk into a George Oya anatomy class um, followed by a phys class um, those, those are rough scenarios, but that gift of those two gentlemen's time was, uh, was what I needed to stay the course and finish what I started. So th that's my favorite, um, moments that I can appropriately put out here on, uh, a public sector. Thomas and I could probably sit back and, uh, and, and enjoy a lot more story time. Uh, from cat back corner, but uh, we're just going to keep it uh, PG. So that's my, my deal. And being a kid that grew up in Chicago, I don't know if this is a, a will qualify as a historical figure, but uh, Walter Payton was always my uh, idol growing up. Idol. Walter Payton Jersey hanging in my area here. Um, so between uh, Walter and uh, 
there's some time I spent with Joe Frazier back a few years back. Um, those are my, my two um, black figures that I just enjoy thinking about. And I guess for me, uh, you know, I graduated in 77, 1977, and then I got inducted uh, 2012. And my daughter came up, my youngest daughter, Kayla, came up with me. Uh, and we, we were on the field before the game started. And then uh, we looked up in the stands because people kept calling my name and looked up in the stands and all. It must have been 20, 25 people who stood up and they had a Conchi bag with them. So it's been 35 years since I've been making those bags. And these, and these, I guess they were customers and uh, staff that was worked at Limpo who bought bags from me. They still had their bags and they brought them to, they brought them to the game. And I, it was unbelievable <laughs> that they, they stood in the stands and they were holding their bag up, waving it. Hey, we still got my Conchi bag. And that was, and my, and my youngest daughter goes, Wow, Dad, I guess you really did some stuff here, didn't you? <laughs> and then the other thing that uh, it's the friendship that I made and the friendships that I've kept. I mean, have, I've got a core group of friends from Linfield, non-athletes and athletes who uh, I stay in touch with constantly. We stay in touch with constantly. And and, and they stay in touch with their whole, they got a whole core group of people that they stay in, in touch with. You know, uh, people like uh, Broody Abri, Athari, uh, Gerald King, who, went, who grew up with me in Pacoima, William Settles, who was from Pacoima, Leo Sloan, who's from Seaside, uh, Duffy Snyder, Larry Doty, uh, J James Taylor, who we call JT, uh, you know, John Lee, I mean, I, I, you know, I got a whole group of people that I stay in touch with and the friendships that I've carried up that have developed over the years. You know, we go to people's houses and do barbecues and everything. I don't know if I have this picture in my phone, but I got a picture where we went, I went to a barbecue and Coach Rushman came down. He would always come down and there'd be at least 12 or 10 or 12 of us out of our families. We'd have a barbecue at one of our houses and I, and at the time I had cut my Afro. So I, I came out, I came out, uh, out the house and had an Afro wig on and coach Rutschman snatched it off my head and put it on. And that was the funniest thing you want to see, <laughs> but you know, but the, the core group of friends that I've continued to stay in touch with is it's just unbelievable. And we, we, you know, we're, we're really close. We send Christmas cards to each other and all that. We get to go to each other's house and barbecue. And then I guess my favorite, athletes that I uh, that I looked I really looked up to was Gail Sayers and OJ Simpson. Oh there, Doug's got the picture with me and Coach Rushman with Afro. <laughs> My Afro we got. That was so funny. So I mean so I mean for me that's that's you know I, again I've had a great Linfield experience. Yeah, you know I, I couldn't trade it for the world. Thank you, Drake. Mm -hmm. Well should we wrap things up, Jane? I think uh I know all of us have to get back to working other things, but it's over an hour and we should go a little longer, but i um, grateful for your time and just love having Thomas and Payne and Drake join us for a Friday and, uh, you know, spend some memories. I know we could be here for two hours and just tell stories about things. that No we've question. Done, but, you know, no, no question. Hey, we, we, we could be on it for a long time, man. No doubt. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. If I have to go back and just mention one thing, Doug. One of my all-time memories is walking into that locker room and seeing you and your in your long johns <laughs> with your dinner and the uh, and the cowboy remote breaking down film. That was a mainstay. We knew we were going to be a long night if Doug was already in his underwear on that couch. <laughs> so I will always appreciate that and those times. And Thomas, I would appreciate the opportunity that I spent with you coaching and talking. Um, and, uh, and I do remember a frustrating time that you had that we had a conversation, in, and this will take you way back, blockbuster video when your ankle was jacked up. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and we 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 hashed it out right there in the uh, comedy section. Yeah. 
And, and it was all, all systems go after that. And that, and I've seen that competitive Thomas side. And I, I will always remember how angry you, that was like Hulk angry at PLU, but I appreciate <laughs> you for, for being that way. That was, that made it all better. So yeah. love you, man. Yeah, Tremaine, you, you kept my, uh, you kept me going on those meetings because he was always bringing those, uh, uh, those sticks, those pepperoni sticks. Pepperoni sticks, baby. Uh, <laughs> Thomas, your best game and worst game. I mean, yeah, that was you know, yeah record game yeah. where record you thought game. people thought about pulling you even after you fumbled once and then twice. And I says, no, we gotta yeah. keep. No, going. no, no, coach. You said, coach, what are you doing? Get him back in there. That's <laughs> what it was. <laughs> That is that is a, a, a great day too, Coach. Because you're right. I, I I know I set a school record that day, but I, I just couldn't think of anything else. But I felt like I let my teammates down by putting the ball in the. I only had five fumbles my whole career, and three of them were in one game, right? So, again, I, that that was uh, another really good memory. Was Coach Hire like literally chewing Coach Haberberger out at the time uh, about not putting me back in the game? Um, but again, that that just speaks a lot to the belief you guys have and in your athletes and, and really the relationships the coaches at Linfield have with their athletes. And I think when you know your personnel and you really know them, not just as athletes, but you know them as people, you're gonna always get a lot more out of them than, than any, any other situation you could possibly think of. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Uh, I just put the playlist link in there. You can check out this uh, conversation in more detail if you came on late or if you had to jump off early. Um, next week, I just want to point out that we've got uh, four business leaders coming. We've got um, four women who are uh, involved in sports business. So if you have no uh, connections in sports business and you are looking to graduate anytime in the next year or so, this is a great group of women to get to know and to connect with and hear their stories. So tune in next week, same uh, Zoom link. Thank you everyone for being here. We appreciate your time so much. All the best to you. Go Cats. Go Thanks cats. to all the student athletes that were on the call too. Best of luck to you guys. Go get them. Go get them. Go Wildcats.